Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. We have to our motion. Welcome to our weekly shear on, on the sitter. And uh, this morning, I want to dedicate the uh, shear to the memory of uh, my wife's grandmother, my mother-in-law's mother. They're both online uh, from Israel. Um, Rona Katz, Rezel Beth Binyamin, the Tova Riva, who, who passed away earlier this week uh, in the uh, at 96. Uh, so it's Baruch Hashem, she had a long and uh, meaningful and fruitful life and, uh, and uh, really an, an amazing woman, a woman of, of grace, humility, <clears throat> dignity. She grew up in, in South Africa and uh, lost her father at a, a young age, grew up really without any material uh, possessions, you know, very uh, poor family met her husband and basically uh, decided to take on a life of observance that her husband insisted upon. And uh, they had a wonderful 59 years together. It's, uh, I, I don't, I've never met uh, a woman more devoted to a husband than, uh, you know, Ilana's grandmother. It's uh, to, to Mrs. Katz. She was, uh, anybody who knew her, knew her devotion to her husband was really unparalleled. They, they don't make them like that anymore. I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but that's just the way, that's what's uh, who she was and uh, her smile always and her, her grace was really um, a tremendous model for the entire family. And I must say that I think our, our children are blessed that they had a, a great grandmother for, for so many years. And uh, basically every Shabbos, she, they moved to Canada in 1986 and just live uh, you know, a, a couple of blocks away from us. And uh, that was sort of part of our uh, you know, extended family and part of our Shabbos experience for years. They, they would eat with us every meal in the last few years that wasn't really possible anymore and so we would uh, go there make Yiddish and sing so I just want to want to dedicate this year of course in her memory and uh, we should have um, happy occasions to come together to uh, to celebrate okay mm -hmm. okay we're in the middle of uh, hopefully we'll finish I always say we're going to finish something and we never quite get there but hopefully we will um, okay we're in the middle of and uh, Two weeks ago, we discussed our animalistic, you know, tendencies where nobody's, who are we, what are we doing with our life, you know, all the, all the, all the negativities of man. And then last week, we, I mean, last week, but in the middle of the prayer, or it switches, we are the children of the covenant and who God made a special relationship. Abraham had a tremendous love, Abraham, the, the one who loved God. Uh, Yaakov, who was a uh, Yashar, we spoke about last week, then it seems a fantastic introduction to Bereshit, say for her Yashar, the importance of getting along with people, even people you do not like and do not respect. Um, but that's uh, what it means to be a Yashar, more important than being a, a Sadiq. And of course, it's Yaakov Avinu, who is the, really the founder of B'nai Israel. That's why we're called B'nai Israel, because uh, Yaakov Avinu is the only one who uh, created the foundation of a nation. You can't create very much in the future if you only have one child who follows in your path you know it's not that's going to work very long so of course it's Yaakov and uh we are the Bnei Israel and the, the joy the Havan the, the Simcha we we talked about Krat Shemo Yisrael Yishun okay so now we're in the I guess it's the it's the last paragraph I don't know in my corn sitter it's page 37 but that's I think you know you're meaningless for people that's uh Anyways, <coughs> unless you have the corn sitter I have. Sounds like on Pesach. Which I guess it sort of is. Therefore, therefore, we must, um, we are obligated to give thanks to God. What's the therefore? The fact that he chose us. That's what we're giving thanks for, that God chose us to have a special relationship with him. Um, and therefore, we have to uh, praise his name and uh, glorify him. And uh, bless him, the hodot, the shabeach, the fa'er, the barak. And we say all these uh, words a lot. It's it's hard to know sometimes, or at least I I, I don't know. And not so many of the commentaries talk about the exact differences between the words. I mentioned before the malbim. That was a, a special. Um, Thing that he used to do, he used to often uh, say the differences between, two, like uh, often haron, okay, you know, different words that are used. So he often talked about it. So different, uh, but uh, I don't know where I, I don't have a precise and good explanations for the exact differences between all these words of praise. But here we say a uh, hoda is thanksgiving and shevach is praise, per is is glory, leverek blessing, the kadesh to sanctify. And again, so I just mentioned that. I guess it's a little bit obvious, but let me just show you. I'll share my screen for a minute. 
and um, talk about the importance of Hakarat Hatov. So we're thanking God that the, how lucky we are that God chose us to be his nation. So this I've often mentioned, this is uh, the first sin of man, really. I mean, I, if you want to say the first sin of man is eating from the eight hat, 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 but this is uh, where it happened. I mentioned a number of times that uh, chapter three, the, the Nachash was a very sly, uh, sly creature, right? And it got the man to sin. And then, uh, where are you? I said, that's the first question in the Torah. Where is man? That's how the Torah yeah. begins. And that's, I mentioned that uh, uh, a very, you know, one of the advantages of teaching, you know, kids who may not have a great background, who may not have grown up observant, like many of the kids who I teach at chat. So uh, they, you know, they just, they think uh, outside of the box, you know, kids who are brought up in a certain environment, sort of, uh, they, they're trained to think in a certain way, which isn't always, always good. They don't always have that breath. So when I mentioned, you know, the Aseret Yimei Tshuva, what's Aseret Yimei Tshuva? So the person said, well, that's the 10 days to answer questions. So it's very cute. But, uh, you know, and then I said, okay, if that's the question, I didn't even know what, she, you know, I, so on the spot, I said, uh, so what's, what's the, oh, those are the 10 days of answers. I've started to make true So I said, so what's the question? I, and I, I didn't know myself as I said, what's the question? Then it hit me, of course. The question is Ayeka. Where's man? That's 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 what we do. I'm Rosh Hashanah between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Sarah to make true We answer the question Ayeka. Well, that's the first question in the Torah, man, where are you? Anyways, that's the introduction to the sin. And what, what does man say? So this is a uh, very different, uh, a different relationship between a husband and a wife. The wife who you gave me, it's her fault. What do you want from me? So of course, deflection of personal responsibility, that's uh, the human nature. But the, the words, the, the, the woman who you gave me, God, it's all your fault. You know, I was happy to be alone. You, you said that man's not good to be alone. I, I didn't ask you for that. So it's your fault. So Rashi says right away, I have it here in the English, Hebrew, Kan Kafar B'Torah, it's more powerful than Hebrew. Here, man, um, Kafar, he, he, had, he was a heretic, right? Kafar is to he, he denied. We call a kofar one who denies the essence yes. of Jerusalem. He, he denied good. So this is basically the first sin of man, Hakar Tov. And therefore, so much of Judaism is about Hakar Tov. Everything we do is Hakar Tov. You make 100 brachot a day because that's Hakar Uh, You know, a, anything we do, we're supposed to demonstrate Hakar Tov. That's the basic uh, bread and butter, uh, so to speak, uh, quality that... Um, a, a Jew needs. So there we, we thank God for everything. So the greatest thanking God here, we're saying, you know, early in the morning every day is that he, um, he chose us um, and he may have a special relationship. I mentioned, you know, Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, often commented that one of the, the tragedies in uh, American Jewish life was that, um, you know, people would say, I, you, know, you, all, you all know by now my Yiddish is like non-existent, but uh, it's Shver Sezayin Yid, right? It's hard to be um, a Jew. And uh, Rav Moshe said, that's a terrible thing to say. And what happened is kids grew up in America. It, it was hard to be a Jew. It, it wasn't that it wasn't true. Uh, you couldn't get a job to be, especially being a, to be any Jew. I mean, obviously anybody living in the Holocaust in the generation, like uh, post-Holocaust, obviously are the, the, the worst thing in the world. Who would want to be Jewish? I mean, they got killed and persecuted. And I, I don't think we're aware of how many people, um, when I went to Poland a number of, of years ago, I, I guess I, I was made aware of how many Jews basically after the Holocaust just became non-Jews and they totally denied their Jewishness and their kids didn't know they're Jewish. And I get, you know, there, there are thousands of people like that. When you, when you go to Poland, they'll, they'll tell you that, um, you know, I, we asked Rabbi, Rabbi Schuldrich, I think that's his name, the, the, the chief rabbi in Poland for many years. We said, how many Jews live in Poland? He says, he doesn't know, but there's more every day. And basically what happens is every day people die and the children, the grandchildren, the whatever, go through the, the, the papers in the attic and they discover that their grandparents were Jewish. They have no idea because and then they want to reclaim their heritage um, a, a little bit because uh, who would want to be Jewish after World War Two? I mean, uh, anybody who, you know, who maintained their Jewishness, what an amazing, uh, amazing, you know, you know, you know, you know, person we don't realize. I, I remember Alan, to, on, a, on a lighter note, but on the serious issue when uh, Ralph Branca 
um, died. So uh, you, every if, I, I'll do what Rav Aaron Lichtenstein did a number of years ago. The, who here doesn't know who Ralph Frank is? Or I don't know if I should ask in the positive or the negative. Can can I have a show of hands or put in the in the chat box if you know who Ralph Frank is? Kova, you you must know. I told you 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 gonna. Why most it's people don't know who Ralph Frank is? Am I correct? Sports related, no. I'm sorry, sports related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he gave up the. I, I'll tell. I told the story once before, but it's always worth telling again. And I guess most people weren't there when I told it. Um, Rob Branca was a, a pitcher on the uh, on the Brooklyn Dodgers. And uh, remember the Brooklyn Dodgers? I don't, but uh, I know of them. And uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. And in 1951, um, the. Um, the Giants um, uh, were the New York Giants. Now the San Francisco, San Francisco Giants and the LA Dodgers used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. And they uh, and uh, the Giants were 14 games behind for the pennant. Then only two, one team made the playoffs. It was much better. One of the American League, one national. Not like today, everybody makes the playoffs. So uh, they were 14 games behind in August. And they won like 35 of the last 40 games. And they caught LA on the last day of the season to tie them. So uh, they had a three game playoff to see who would advance to the World Series. So in game three, it was one one, it was the bottom of the ninth inning and it was four one for the, the Dodgers. They, they scored a run, it was four two, two men on base. And, uh, and, and Bobby Thompson came to the plate, uh, probably perhaps the most famous play in baseball history. And Bobby Thompson hit a three run home run. And you can hear the announcer, if you've ever heard, it's a famous tape, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. And uh, that was, I called the shot heard around the world. Oh. And my father happened to have been at that, that game. I, I, everybody came there and he left early because he was uh, in rabbinic school and he was, was, was tutoring. So he had to go teach somebody. So he left like in the seventh inning. Like, I, I, I don't know, I, I am not such a tzaddik. I don't know that I could leave uh, the pennant game in, in, in the seventh inning, but uh, for, uh, for the, world series anyways so uh ralph branca was the pitcher who gave who pitched the that and i remember when um and many a number of years when i was in yu rev, rev lichtenstein used to come to yu at least you know once a year for he would spend uh, a shabbos in yu and all the you know yeshiva heart young graduates would come and he would speak and uh, on friday night he would do what we call a press conference that uh, you can ask him whatever you want uh, ask the rabbi whatever you want and Ravarn would sit there and people would ask him all kinds of a fascinating question. So somebody asked him, are there tragic figures in Tanakh? You know, uh, we, like in literature, you know, tragic figures. So he said, uh, let me give you an example. Like, you mean like Ralph, Ralph Branca? He said, like, Ralph Branca is a tragic figure. So he, and he looked around the room and he saw these like blank stares. He said, you know who Ralph Branca is, don't you? And of course, I'm sure everybody here knows. And, and most people know Ravarn Lichtenstein was a tremendous baseball fan growing up he, and he was a Bucky in baseball like uh I'll, I'm not quite like in shots I don't know maybe yes like in shots but he <laughs> knew everything about baseball he knew everything about everything everything he learned he was a, a brilliant genius but he was a big baseball fan uh, a, a Chicago Cubs fan so he mentioned Ralph Branca and he saw people didn't know so and he defined tragedy as somebody who can have a, a a wonderful life and then one moment defines their entire life so Ralph Branca was a very good pitcher but nobody cares he was a good pitcher they know he gave up the bit back to, to hit the, the pitch to, to lo lose the, the pennant for the Giants to win the pennant. So, uh, and then he said, Rav Aaron said that Miriam is a tragic figure because the Torah tells us, how do we remember Miriam? We remember Miriam, um, Zachor at the Sher, uh, Sa Shem and Miriam, uh, I forget the exact, exact pasuk. Remember, she, she spoke Lashon Hara on Moshe. And then back in the Siddur, where we have every day, the six the Sheish the Chirot. You have to remember the Maman Har Sinai and the Man and uh, and Kri and and Shabbos. So one of the things we have to remember every day is that Miriam. I mean, I don't know how many people actually say it, but I think you know what I'm talking about. In the back of the sitter, the Sheish the Chirot. So um, one of the things you have to remember every day is that Miriam spoke Lashon. That's a uh, Miriam. We wouldn't be here without Miriam. She saved Moshe. She was the heroine. It was, uh, she told her parents to remarry. She was, but she did everything. Mir the, and, the, and that's why it's in her merit that we have water in the desert. Water is more important than food. In the school of Moshe, we had food. Okay, we had food. Not that food's unimportant, but uh, obviously the fact that our sages link, and God does it when she dies, there's no water, link the, the water to Miriam, tells Miriam was more important than, than Moshe. What an amazing woman. And yet, and yet, 
um, she has to be remembered in history for having this little mistake. What did she say that was so bad that, that we also spoke to God where, you know, it wasn't even such lush and horror. Like what she said, you know, I know, I know, like she said, why Moshe are you so different? We, we also spoke to God. So she didn't understand Lo Kain Abdi Moshe, as God said, my servant Moshe is different. The relationship between God and Moshe is different than with any other prophet. But how are they supposed to know that? So it's a little mistake. And yet that's how I remember. That's a track. Record. So why am I telling all this? I know it's interesting and I like it. And you don't like it? Okay, I'm sorry. But uh, what, what happened is when Ralph Branca, a year before he died, died not so long ago, um, was in the New York Times. Uh, and uh, he discovered he was Jewish. His mother was a survivor and didn't want the kids to know, didn't want to raise kids as Jews. So it's, uh, there, there are thousands of people like that. And uh, we obviously don't know them because we're here as Jews, but, um, and I don't criticize them. Uh, how can I criticize them? Uh, you know, uh, what they went through, uh, why be Jewish? But, but it's, it's a joy, it should be. And Baruch Hashem for us living today, it's, despite all the increase in anti-Semitism, yesterday was Holocaust, the Memorial Day and the, and, the, and the Holocaust denial. I was very nice putting on the radio. So many of the radio shows were talking about the Holocaust. Baruch Hashem, I mean, uh, you know, at least there's an awareness, even the UN, you know, it's the, it's a UN day. It's not the Aryama Shoah's after, after Pesach, but the international one. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, we should give thanks for what we have. It's, and, uh, we, we who grew up here and, and whatever, uh, always, so Rev, Rev, Rev Moshe said, it's a terrible thing to say it's hard to be a Jew, because if it's hard to be a Jew, who wants to be Jewish? <laughs> Most people don't like hard. It takes a very mature person to understand that anything meaningful in life takes hard work. So yes, maybe an adult, but no kid, no kid can understand that. So if the kid hears from the parents, it's fair to, it's, it's fair to design a yid or whatever the expression is. It's hard to be Jewish and it's hard and, and we we're poor because we're Jewish because we can't get a good job. We can't do this again. It's okay, I won't, I, won't, I won't be Jewish. It can be hard, but you don't have to stress that. You can say it's wonderful to be Jewish. It's a tremendous schut. It's a wonderful thing. That's always what I try to teach mm -hmm. uh, the kids it's such a beautiful thing shabbos is so beautiful and the the value system and we're we're not strong enough on ourselves you know we're weak people we're humans that's what it means to be human we're we're, we're the weakest of all the mammals we are the weakest we're just uh, the, the biggest brain but we and we sometimes don't use it but we're the mm -hmm. we are the weakest of uh of uh humans but uh, and therefore we will fail so the torah tells us not to fail, right? Uh, it's hard to keep a diet. Uh, it's, it's very hard to go on diet, as anybody who's tried knows. And even if you go, that it's not hard at all to keep kosher because it's God's will. Uh, you know, I can be basically starving and you put a delicious uh, piece of cake or something wonderful to eat and it isn't kosher, you know, so, uh, so what? I have no desire to eat it. And uh, so that's the power of the Torah. That's the beauty of the Torah, that the Torah gives us these values that because they're from the Torah, you have a much greater ability to keep them on our own as human beings, you know, to go on, on, a, on, a, on a diet. Okay, very good. So I'll go for a week and then I'll, I'll cheat a little bit and then I, I give up and diets don't work anyways. So uh, that's, uh, that's just in terms of how it, um, it, it helps us. That's not necessarily why we have the mitzvot, although Ratzah uh, Kadesh Baruch Hu is Akotit Yisrael, Pichak Hirbelehem Torah. Mitzvot. So right, hi, right, we say that every week when we finish per Avot or the or when the rabbi, you know, he makes a, a drush and wants somebody wants to make Kiddush. So I'm a Rabbi Kanan Yivan and Akashi Omer Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Zachot Yisrael. God wanted to give merit to the Jewish people. Lepichak here b'lehem Torah Mitzvot. Therefore, he increased the Torah Mitzvot. So how how, how do you translate that term? Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Zachot. God wanted a merit. Well, what merit do we get by getting more Mitzvot? How, how do we normally, I think, I'm thinking of now on top of my, how, how would you translate that? Anybody? What's the merit that we're getting by so many mitzvot? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Answer. So I would think that most people would say the merit, we have more mitzvot, we get more of a, a reward, either in Olam Hazar or Olam Haba. God gives us an opportunity. When you say hello to somebody in the morning, you fulfill a, a mitzvah. That's great. I would have said hello anyway. In other words, uh, honor your parents. I would honor my parents anyway. Uh, there are certain things we do. The Torah, you don't need a mitzvah to do it, but the Torah makes it a mitzvah. So it makes a mitzvah. So now we get a reward from it. So God wanted to give us merit or re reward us. So he gave us Torah mitzvah. But I think that's, I'm sure. I think, I think that the merit is that we live a better life. 
That's correct. That's what I'm saying now. It's excellent. That's what that I point. The Zakot doesn't have to, do, have to do anything with reward. God wanted us to have a better life. He gave us torments, but so God knows that I'll, I'll keep Shabbos. Tell me to turn off my computer for one day. Oh my gosh, it's impossible. I'm like everybody. I, I'm not a, whatever. I don't, I'm not even on social media. I don't, I, I don't look at our Facebook page. Uh, Tor Motion has Facebook. I never look at it. I never seen Twitter. I don't know what Instagram is. Then now there's some person, woman on, on TikTok or something. I thought I was totally turned off, but that's a whole other story. If you know what, I don't know what these things are. And yet, just the internet alone and email is addictive and tell to, to take a day off. I would never do it. I could never do it. I, who, who, who can get it? I mean, I, I don't sleep with the phone next to me, but you know, check your, your WhatsApp and check everything every 10 seconds. You know, we know it's like, like go, go with, nobody can do that. Ah, shop is no problem. It's like the, the smokers, you know, anybody, um, unfortunately who smokes and uh, people, thank God, uh, smoking is much, much less these days, but uh, everybody knows the, a, a smoker comes Shabbos, he doesn't even have a desire to smoke. It's an amazing thing, the power of the mind. The second Shabbos ends, he'll, he needs that, that cigarette immediately. So, Ratzak Kadesh Barakal is Akwatit Yisrael. At least one day you don't smoke. One day you're not on social media. One day. It's not good. We don't want all day. Internet is good. We couldn't have all our shiurim without it. But then, not every day. But we can never do it on our own. So, Ratzak Kadesh Barakal is Akwatit Yisrael. God wanted us to have a better life. So they gave us Torah Mitzvah. Torah Mitzvah gave us the power, the power to uh, do what's right, in addition to the reward. Okay. Therefore, we got a Hodot, the Shabbat, the Fa'er. Okay. Ashreinu, um, how blessed we are. Ashrei, That's uh, right. Ashrei, Ashreinu Matavta. How wonderful, blessed is our part. I, I, I just, you know, point, these are sort of obvious things, but we don't think about it enough, how, how lucky we are to have such a beautiful Torah and such a beautiful way of life. And that's, as we're going to see, that's really what um, a Kiddush Hashem is. That's what's, this is all leading up to Kiddush Hashem. The brach ends, Mekadesh at Shemo Berabim, to sanctify God's name. Re remember, I've, it's been like so many weeks we're on it, we forget, you know, we lose the, the big picture sometimes. This was instituted during a time of persecution, right? The Jews weren't allowed to say Shema. So they say, Lo lami adem, the, the satyrs, you say this this quietly. This was said at home, it wasn't said in shul. We weren't allowed to say this in shul. So this was added in a time of persecution where Jews were willing to give up their life, as some did, and have through their okay. So they said, okay, say Shema at home. So this is all the notion of um, uh, willing to sanctify one's life. But we'll get there in um, uh, a couple minutes. It's also interesting. The the words I was looking in all the sidurim, they not so many in the first really go through the exact difference between all these synonymous words, but okay. Tov, naim, and yafe. Right? So Ashrenu Matov. Tov is good, like God created a a, a good world. By Tov Ma'od, right? Titov, Titov, Tov. Everything is good. Naim is pleasant. Pleasant, naim, naim or it's, um, comfortable also. But naim, how did they translate it? I didn't even I didn't even look. Happy are we? How good is our portion? How lovely. They translate naim, okay. And mayafe, mayafe, how beautiful. Yafe is probably um, normally in the Torah, it's 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 physical beauty. Uh yafat toar, but yafat mare, right? Um a tov is probably more on a you know on a conceptual level, like God creating the world. It's good for us. Naim is pleasant, easy. I've mentioned before, you know, the, the debate um, between Beit Hill and Beit Shammai is it's a depressing debate, right? I mentioned for three years, three years they debate. I think that's what the Gemara says. Three years they debate. Is it good for man to have been created or not? Is it good? No. Noach Lola Adam Shanivra. No, is it, it's a good. So it's normally people will translate as it's the mistranslation. Is it good for man to have been created? And the back and forth. And the Gemara comes to the conclusion not good. It would have been better not to have been created. But since we were created, uh, what can we do? You know, like God, Adam complained. Uh, he has the Isha. Nobody asked him. God created us. So, uh, examine your ways. Which the implication of that Mara is, it's not, probably the meaning, probably the meaning of the Mara is, it's not good to be created with no moral values, with nothing. 
But once you are created, if I look, at, examine your deeds, ah, so live a life of good examination, then it will be good to be created. Tosfot alludes to that. He doesn't say that. He says uh, that's only for normal people. But uh, at Sadiq, it is good they were created. Okay, so that's how you sort of, it's not man on his own. It would have been better had he not been created. If he's Yifash Fesh with myself, if he examines his ways and lives a proper life, it is good he's created. That, that, okay, very nice. I also think it's important the word is at the beginning, Noach lo la Adam. It doesn't say Tov lo la Adam. The, the question is, is it, was it good for man? That would be the word Tov. The word is Noach. Noach means is it comfortable to have been created? There's a huge difference between good and comfort. Um, many good things are not comfortable. And that's, I think, Rav Salvechi. I, I never heard this this particular thing from him but the uh, rav's whole idea that um of course it was good for man to be created how can you say that? that's what it says in the torah 15 times it was great he says that after the creation right oh top to every it was good is it comfortable oh, that's a different story uh you can't be comfortable because life has so many problems and we our job is to fix the problems so we can't have a life of comfort, that's Yaakov Avinu, right? Bikesh Yaakov, Leishay Beshava. Yaakov wanted to relax, and God got angry at him. What are you relaxing for? No way. And in Olam Haba, you know, not in Olam Haza. This world, by Yeshev Yaakov, he wanted to relax. 108 years old, he had a hard life. Let me live my life out in retirement. And uh, no, no, no. That's not the role of a Sadiq. There's no Minucha. Um, that's the Gemara at the end. In Megillah, well, we, we just had this in Dafyomi, I think, or it's coming up in Dafyomi. Now I forget that how how Tzadikim have no rest in this world and no. I think it's the end of on, in Megillah. Um, the end, no rest in this world, no rest in the world to come. That rest, Noach, Noach lo ladam shenivra. No, it's not Noach, but it is good. But anyways, here we have this notion: how blessed is our our portion? How uh, naim? I don't know. Comfortable is our lot, our fate, and my and how nice or good is a uh, good looking, what a beautiful is our Yerusha. So what again, what is Chelek? So again, you have Tov, Naim, and Yafe. So they're all similar, of course. And then you have Chelek, Goral, and Yerusha. Our portion, our Chelek, our Goral is sort of our lot. Life is a Goral. We're coming up to Rosh Kodesh Adar. And even though it's only Adar Aleph, really Adar Aleph is the real Adar. Adar Beit is the add-on. Only Mikra Mikila. Any other mitzvah can be done. The mission is very clear. There's no difference. We could, we don't do it. We could do Zachar and Shkalim, all the four parsha before other Aleph. And we could even do the Sudat Purim in other Aleph. We could even do Mishloach Manot in other Aleph. The Gemara says, oh, other bait is only Mikram Megila, Amatanot Levinim, which should have been another Aleph. But we want to have other bait. We want to have Purim and Pesach next to each other. That's a whole other shir. We'll have to leave for another time. That's what the Gemara says. Mitzvah baliyach al tach mitzvah. We, you know, it's reason Makdimim. Of course, we should read the Megillah and other Aleph. But no, we want to have Purim next to Pesach. So, okay, but that's Mikra Megillah. So the Gemara says only Mikra Megillah. And Mikra Megillah requires Matanot Levyonim. Because the poor people hear the reading of the Megillah. Ah, they know they're going to get gifts. So we need Matanot Levyonim. So therefore, they go together. But everything else could be done another. We, of course, today, we're not going to do it that way. But when you had a not fixed calendar, and they and they didn't know sometimes till after Purim, they would sometimes add the other bait after Purim. So you'd have to reread the Megillah, but you wouldn't have to reread the double Arpa Parsha. You wouldn't have to reread, you wouldn't have to redo a Suda even. You just have to read the Megillah. But anyways, so Goral, Goral, Goral is Purim. The Rav said that's our lot. And our lot means what God gives us. We don't have a choice necessarily. Our, our, the Rav explains that's the connection to Yom Kippur and Purim, right? Everybody knows Yom Kippurim, right? Purim is the most holy day of the year because Yom Kippur is like Purim, right? That, I mean, yeah. obviously not on a simple level. This is a drasha, you know, a, on a mystic Yom Kippurim. Yom Kippur is like Purim. Of course, the two most opposite days of the world. This is a ridiculous, what are the rabbis out of their mind? They must have been had too much to drink to make such a uh, comparison between Yom Kippur and Purim. How can you say such a thing? So, of course, it's a uh, fasting and feasting. That's also the beautiful idea that, of course, uh, there are two ways to worship God. It's much better to worship God through feasting than fasting. But the Rav has a whole essay about this. So one of the points he develops in the essay is our, our, um, our claim for tshuva is that life is a lot, like, like, like porn. In other words, God, you know, it's your fault. You made us born in America in the 21st or 20th century. 
what do you expect from us? The temptations, it's impossible. How can you expect the Jew to be religious growing up in, uh, you know, in, in Hollywood or where, you know, wherever? I, 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 I picked an easy one, you know, because I don't think anybody here grew up in Hollywood. I don't mean Florida. Um, but, um, so, um, um, you know, it's, it's impossible. You know, as we, we raised in the shtetl in Poland, of course, I'd be religious. Uh, that, that, what do you want from us? It's not, uh, you know, it's like the Gemara says, you put somebody in front of a house of, of, of prostitution, you put a kid there. Well, what do you think is going to happen, right? So, so, um, so we come to God. We say, God, you gave us. You, you, we lucked out. We or we unlocked out, and therefore, that's why we can do tshuva. It's not our father. Whether that's a good claim or not, but that's a, I have to reread it. But that's how the rub sort of one of the comparisons between Purim, Yom Kippurim, and and uh, and Yom Kippur is the idea of lots life. And we know, of course, lots are true on Yom Kippur too. It's not just on Purim, right? The, with the two Seirim, which one goes Lazazel and which one is a Korban? Hey, hey. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. We lost your we lost your sound. Nope. Maybe point to your ear. No. Hmm. Somebody, oh, we all point to our ear. Maybe yes. if we all point to our ear, let him know that we can't hear. Can you hear now? Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't know what happened. And my 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 video won't be as good now, but okay. I don't know. I, I that's very strange, but okay. But Baruch Hashem. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Where did we leave off? Maybe that was a. That's an fair question. You I, were uh, saying you were saying uh, Kippur, Kippur. Right. So Yom, Yom Kippur is the. We also have lots on Yom Yom Kippur. You, did I say? Did you hear hear, hear that part? Just like I'm pouring the Stushti Reem is also done by lots. Anyways, that's a um a goral. That's just really an offside. But uh, life is a goral. Is so life is, and a, a, a goral means luck. I mean, that's what it means. That's the you know hagrala. That, that it's the luck of the draw. Okay, well, whether you believe God, you know, there are no coincidence. Uh, that's not relevant. But it means it's the luck of the what you're going to be. So we we're we're lucky. We're Jewish. We're we're lucky. We're born in the best time in history to be a Jew. We're lucky. We're born in Canada or okay, the United States. Not quite as lucky, but uh, almost as lucky. And uh, I'm you know uh, who you. Uh, to be born in 1930 in Poland, you're very unlucky. To be born in uh, 1960 in Canada, you're very lucky. So um, very much of life is um, really a, a goral. And that's like Rev. Salavetsu said, that's our claim to, to tshuva. Um, Yerusha, of course, generally is a reference to our Torah. Mayafe Yerusha Tenu, uh, we thank God we got the Yerusha. Because Torah, truth of the matter is Torah is not really a Yerusha. In this context, it's a Yerusha. But in the Torah, the Torah is a Morasha, not a Yerusha. Torah Tzival and Moshe, Morasha. What's the difference between a Yerusha and a Morasha? Anybody? Um, a Yerusha, you just earn, uh, you just get, but a Morasha, you have to work work on. Excellent. Correct. A Yerusha, you, a parent dies, a grandparent dies, uh, you, you get money, right? One of my favorite halachot, if I can say that. This is, again, another thing. You need the Torah for this. One of my favorite halachot is when a parent dies, you inherit a million dollars, you make two brachot. Dayan yes. Ha'emet and Shecheyano. Wow. Wow. You're rich. You inherit a million dollars. Don't tell me you're not happy you got a million dollars. I don't care how sad you are that your parent died. Let's be real. Now, for any human being to come and get and say that, can you imagine a rabbi saying, you know, you just inherited a million dollars, then you just make a shift and he'd throw you out. You'd punch in the face. My father just died. What, what are you doing? I'm just be happy, make, make a bracha, got a million dollars, get out of here. 
But when Chazal ordained such a bracha, it's it's so beautiful. Chazal had the tremendous insight to know that, uh, yeah, you, you can be sad. Of course, no one is saying they want their parent to die to get a million dollars. I mean, maybe some do, unfortunately, but uh, normal people don't want that. But it still doesn't mean they're they're sad. They're, they're still happy they got a million dollars. So you have to make a bracha. What an amazing halakha. What amazing um, halakha. So that, again, the sages had to impose that halakha. No, no human being, I, know, I mean, they were, but nobody could really um, say that on their own. So that's a Yerusha is uh, you get an inheritance. Uh, somebody dies and you, you're born into the right family. You know, what What merit, how come this guy's uh, a big macher? He was born into the right family. We all know that. Uh, what's a morasha? A morasha is a heritage. It's not an inheritance. It's a heritage. Torah of a morasha. You work on it, you pass it on to the next generation. You don't just get the Torah. And we, the, the Gemara in the Darim says that, um, the Gemara in the Darim says, that why are the children of Torah scholars generally not Torah scholars? So you have to ask yourself, is that true? Probably is true. Why is some, because nobody should say Torah is a Yerusha. We don't want people to say, you know, why is he a Tamil Chacham? Because his father was a Tamil Chacham. So, and you look around, let's let's take why you, right? So uh, most of the Rebbeim, I don't think their fathers were necessary. I mean, I know I have to go one by one, but uh, we all know many, many rabbis. Uh, they don't come, they come from normal. That's one of the great things, I think, in the modern Orthodox community. People, their parents are successful business people. I can start naming names left and right. Obviously, I'm not going to do that, but I'm sure you can all, all do that. Um, somebody, um, if parents are not uh, Torah scholars and the children become Torah scholars. And then, unfortunately, you can all name parents who are big Torah scholars and their children amount to nothing. I, I, nothing's not a nice thing, but they, they don't become Torah scholars at all. Um, that's so, the Gemara says that's the way it has to be, because otherwise you, ah, what do you want? His father was a great rabbi, of course he's going to be a great rabbi. So it's true in some families, the, in the Soloveitchik family, certain families, but he, even there, of course, they none of them got it because they were, they they had to work too. They they were big mass meeting. You know, pe- people think they don't realize, you know, Rav R- R- you know, so I, I heard different rumors. When I was in yeshiva, so the story was, and I believe the second version, the first version of the story I heard is that Rav Aaron, when in his, the early days in Gush, so Rav Aaron would say to students, like, uh, go to the best university. If you get into Harvard, go to Harvard. Go to Harvard and learn. Learn six hours a day. That's what he would say. He says, I went to Harvard and I learned, I learned six hours a day. He, and he wasn't against Yeshiva University, but he, I, I, it's what I heard. I didn't hear it myself. But he said, okay, you can go to Harvard. He, he went to Harvard. I mean, Rav Soloveitch, all three of his kids went to Harvard. You know, you don't, you don't have to, you can learn Torah, even not in Yeshiva University and, uh, or not in Lakewood. So um, that's where I heard it. When he passed away, Rabbi Avishai David, um, as some of you may know him, he was the Rosh Yeshiva here in Orchaim in Toronto in the 80s, I guess. And um, he now lives in Israel. He's the Rosh Yeshiva of um, Dol BMT. I don't know what it's called anymore. Torah Shraga. Torah Shraga. He lives in Beit Shemesh. As some of you may know him. Anyway, so he was a, um, a student of Rav Aaron, So he said that Rav Aaron learned 10 hours a day when he went to Harvard. He said, you can go to Harvard and learn 10 hours a day. So I don't know. I can't go to Harvard and I can't learn 10 hours a day, you know. But uh, but um, so, um, you know, you, you, you do what you, you can. You, uh, you know, you, um, so um, you have to work in it. Rav Aran may have been a genius, but he didn't become Rav Aran because he was a genius. There are lots of geniuses out there. And, uh, and uh, you know, but it's hard work. I, I told this story in Rav Soloveitchik. They came to Rav Soloveitchik. How do you know all this philosophy? You know, he was like, uh, you know, he, of course, he was a great Tamil Chacham. So where do you have time? He said, so he said, when you're wasting your time talking about me, wondering, I study philosophy. You know, like, uh, that's it. Uh, I don't know if it's true either, but it's like, of course, it's the idea. You have to work really, really hard. And even the greatest story, Rav Moshe Feinstein wasn't born Rav Moshe Feinstein, and Rav Soloveitchik wasn't born Rav Soloveitchik. It wasn't just you know you know genius. Some of them are blessed with genius. That's the famous comment we did the, the Nitziv last week, right? I don't think I'm and on Sefer Hayashar. So I think may I did did I mention last week when the, the Nitziv his wife wasn't happy in the book that they recounted on the Nitziv because the book starts off that the Nitziv wasn't so smart. He, his wife his wife he, he wasn't he wasn't blessed with genius and uh, but he worked really hard. So the, that was considered a insult. I don't consider that an insult at all. I consider that tremendous praise that a person of average intelligence became uh, the Nitziva. That's not, that's not at all an insult. What to say to someone, whether you're a genius is from God. 
It's what you do with your IQ. Your IQ is determined by God. It's how you apply your IQ. That's up to you. So the fact that someone isn't a genius, well, what, what kind of an insult is that? Even though he's not a genius, he became a tremendous source God. So I remember Gil Pearl, when he came to speak, he did his PhD at Harvard on the Nitzv, did his PhD on the pillar of, of a legend. That's a beautiful play on word, the Nitzv of a legend, the pillar of a legend, right? You all get that. Um, then, then the Nitzv uh, of a legend. So he said, of course, Nitzv really was a genius. It wasn't, uh, it's not really true that he wasn't a genius, but okay, whatever. I don't know. But um, anyways, Torah is a Morasha. It's not a Yerusha. And a Morasha, you got to work. And then just because your father or, or your mother today, maybe Baruch Hashem, hopefully, is a great Tamidah Chachama, uh, doesn't mean you will become one either. Okay, so we have um, Tov and Yafeh, Naim, beautiful, uh, our, our, our chalik, our portion, our goral, our lot, what we lucked out, our yurusha, ashreinu, again, blessed, shanu mashkimim, warim, erevokah, b'chormim, tamayim, b'chormim, ah, so now we get to the whole purpose of this, was to say shema, remember shema, God, you weren't allowed to say shema, so we get up every morning, mashkimim, warim, right, the, you're supposed to get up early in the morning, kum lavodat, Habore, you should always get up before the crack of dawn. Okay, that works if you live in Canada. In the winter in Canada, you can get up before dawn. In the summer, it's uh, not so easy. Um, but mashkimim uma arivim erba boka vermim pamai mecholyam. We have to say get up and say the Shema on time, and then we say of course Shema. And this, of course, the reason why today do we still say the Shema? So he said probably because you know once it put in and the, for persecution, we're going to keep it here. You know, you you call us orthodox as a negative term. We're going to take orthodoxy as our, our pride. So Shema Yisrael, so we put it in the air. And of course, we mentioned if if um, you're concerned, which often is the case, that especially on at the nine o'clock minion on, on Shabbos, uh, everywhere at certain times of the year, you're not going to get to Sofsman Kriyat Shema time. So this is when you're supposed to say Shema. That's why they put in Baruch Shem Kvam Machutol Amved. The Baruch Shem Kvam Machutol Amved doesn't really belong here. It's only if you're saying the Shema and you have it. I don't know how you're sitting has it, but in my sitter in the Koran that I'm using now, and I, it's Vahata Shema Kachabukhalavavcha is only in small, like print, because that's not what you say every day. It's you only say that if you're going to miss the Shema. Like Shema's at 922 and the minions at nine o'clock, so you're not going to get to Shema before. So it's in, in Shul. So you got to say Shema before. So they put that. So otherwise, you just skip to Atau Achaloni Vralam, you're before the world, right? Everybody understand that? Uh, what's it in your sitter? Is it also in small print? Yes. Bahapta, yeah. Now, what's interesting is the halacha will tell you, rabbis will tell you, if you're going to be missing, if it's going to be late, not 9.22 is Sosman Kriyat Shema, you're going to the nine o'clock minion. So you have to say all three paragraphs. Uh, so why, in other words, if you're on time, you don't have to say any of it. Why put anything? And if you're not on time, you have to say all three paragraphs. Why does it print one paragraph? Uh, I, I don't know the real answer to that question, but I think I can get, I mean, uh, you know, could be some some printer somewhere, but probably the answer is because there's really a debate how much of Shema you ever have to say. We we, we have three paragraphs of Shema. I, I told you, we'll, we'll get there and please God, it's, you know, in due course, we'll get to Shema. And um, so, uh, you know, how my, uh, there's nowhere, where, where, where's that you have to say Shema? Uh, the Shema, we, we say you have to say Shema, we'll discuss, I told you, the Pshad of the Psukim is not about Shema, right? When you uh, go to bed, you lie down and you get up. So that really knows, everybody, that's the Shema. Very nice, but it's not talking about Shema, it's talking about Torah. You should teach your children and speak in Torah. When do you talk about Torah? When you're at home, when you get up, it's not about Shema. The rabbis interpreted the Shema, we'll We'll, we'll get there, but it's fine. So you, you have to say Shema. What Shema? We, we say three paragraphs all over the place, maybe just that one paragraph. So the Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, you know what Shema is? Shema Yisrael, Shema Kino, Shema Chad. That's it. That's it. One sentence. Shema Yisrael. I don't have to say any. So I'm imagining, that, I'm guessing that they put in, okay, if you're going to make, listen, you're going to say Shema later anyways. Okay, it'll be after 922. But the Mishnah already says, if you say it later, you didn't get the real mitzvah to say Shema, but it's like Kikorei Torah, which is what Shema. It's like you get the mitzvah of reading Torah. So you're, you're going to say Shema in 15 minutes anyways. So, okay, but uh, we'll, so we'll rely on that opinion that you don't say the whole thing over again. So say the first paragraph. According to many opinions, you've already fulfilled your obligation to Shema. So that's probably why the, the the printers, you know, the printers have so much influence. Uh, you know, what gets printed, I many times the Mara went uh, so upset that they put 
Tosfot on the side of the page. That like bothered him to no end. What a mistake to put Tosfot. That's not what they should have. They should have the other people, not Tosfot. Too complicated. But whatever you put on the side of the Gemara, whatever you put in the Siddur, there's in the printed word, that's what happens. We're, we're supposed to be Torah Shabbat. We're not supposed to be Torah Shabbat. But okay, that's the way it is. Okay, so we won't do Vahapta. We'll save that. Please, God, we'll get there one day when we get to the Shema. So then we say, I just find it's cute. I don't know if it's meaning this, meaningful. So I, I just said, Shema is very important about time. You have to say, the first Mishnah in Shas. You begin Daf Yomi, you begin Shema Barvi. What time do you say Shema? From what time till what time? Timing, the whole first paragraph. And what time in the morning can you say it? How early? How late? I always said, thank God. Thank God. We don't pass the Machloka, Rabbi Yoshua, and Chachamim. How, what's the latest time you can say Shema in the morning? Does anybody know there's a Machloka? So we, uh, there, one, I think it's the Chachamim who say, the latest time you can say Shema, the latest time in the morning is sunrise. Wow. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Thank God. Okay, okay. Maybe you're you're different, but thank God we don't accept that view in halakha. Um, we accept the view of, of Rabbi Yeshua that you have a quarter of the day, three till nine twenty-two, whatever. I mean, I think the earliest Shema ever gets in Toronto, which is a little bit later than in New York, is where West is about nine oh eight. Maybe a little bit later, since we moved when we change the clock now a week later. I, I, it's like nine, nine, ten, nine, fifteen. So, so it's not really ever so early. I mean, even Shabbat. Okay, the nine o'clock minion on Shabbos. That's why our our minion used to have it at eight thirty. Then they moved to eight forty. You know, but uh, it's why uh, you know. But in, in New York, it'll be twenty minutes earlier or so. But anyways, um, we have till three hours. We don't have their thing. So Shema is all about timing. And then we say this paragraph, it's all about God being above time. I just found that kind of cute. It's uh, this, this chapter is all, this paragraph that we added in is all about how God is beyond time. That's, um, that's a very common idea, very important notion. God is above time. That's, uh, that's how some people answer the problem. How can God know everything? And yet we have free choice because it's a, a timing problem, right? That's I gave you that baseball an analogy. If you're listening to a baseball game from 50 years ago and then the, the pitcher throws and you stop the tape, does the batter have free choice to swing at the ball? Oh, that depends. He had free choice in 1951. Bobby Thompson had free choice whether to swing at the ball. But that's before the pitch. But you're listening to the game 50 years later, 71 years later on on, on tape. So uh, does he have free choice? He doesn't really have free choice anymore because it already happened. But that's because it already happened. It hadn't happened. He would have free choice. But God is beyond time. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I mean. But uh, God is above time. So this problem, so you can have free choice and God can know everything. No, no. I don't know if that answer works. But that's what some people say to discuss how can God know everything and yet we have um, free choice. But it's here, so it's all about God being before the world was created, after the world was created, before. And by the way, this is one of the things the Mishnah in Chagiga, we'll get there in about a month in Dafyomi, um, that you're not allowed to in, in, to ask about what came before God. You know, Bereshit Bar Elohim, what, what was before? It's very funny. It's like one of the few areas of life we're not allowed to investigate. That's what the Mishnah says. We can't ask those questions. Everything we can ask, but uh, what happened, what's above, beyond that, uh, it's beyond human comprehension. So that's sort of what we're saying. You were before the world was created. That was God created the world. So we had to exist before the world. You're when the world was created. You're in this world. You're in next world. And therefore, Kadesh et Shimcha. Now we're getting to the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem to uh, sanctify God's name. So I just want to talk about that for a little bit. I don't know if we'll finish it today. We'll, we'll see. So um, I'll, I'll start with this very simple comment. Um, what, uh, what is the worst sin? I mean, I, I, it's always hard. You know, what's the most important verse in Torah? What's it? There are different opinions. But uh, let's say, how does the Rambam define? What's the worst sin a Jew can do? Chilul Hashem. I'm sorry? Chilul Hashem. You got it. Chilul Hashem. The Rambam and Perak Aleph and Hilchot Shuba divides sins that's into that's four that's types of sins. Positive, that's the least bad. So I didn't, I don't have a mezuzah on my door. Okay. So put a mezuzah, end of story. It's not so, you didn't do anything wrong. You, you didn't do something right. Then you have a negative commandment without curry, just a plain run of the mill, not eating, not eating pork. I, I know it's in conceptually, right? But that's why I, I chose that example. Eating pork, I, I don't want to say it's not so bad, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lesser prohibition. It's just a regular prohibition. Torah says, don't eat pork. 
don't wear shatnes. Okay, Beseder. Then you have the more serious ones. Then you have uh, karate and mita, obviously murder, adultery, those things are, you know, the worst, but the, even Shabbos is high up there. And karate, you know, eating blood of a live animal, you know, yeah, we have a karate, 36 of a Roth garden. Then the Ram says, that's all of those you can do tshuva, Yom Kippur helps, uh, helps all or little. You don't need Yom Kippur for a mitzvah to say you don't even need Yom Kippur, whatever. Um, but Chilul Hashem, even Yom Kippur doesn't help. Chilul Hashem, nothing can help until you die. That's the worst sin. So if Chilul Hashem is the worst sin, so what's the what's the best mitzvah? Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem. So Kiddush Hashem is the best mitzvah. So who's learned the Rambam recently? Let's share our screen a, a little bit. And uh, oh, don't tell me my screen share. Yeah, I thought maybe that wasn't working. I don't know why my mic. I really have no idea why that happened, but thank God we're back. Okay. I mean, Mishnah Torah. It says chapter five, but it's sort of chapter one. I'll explain it in a minute. The entire house of Israel. Such a beautiful expression. Kol Beit Yisrael. The, Rambam's, the Rambam often uses the expression, Kol Ba'e Olam. Anybody who's a Ba'olam can sit and learn all day. Ba'olam means Jews and non-Jews. Kol Ba'olam, all creatures of this world. Whenever the Rambam wants to refer to non-Jews, and often in his ethical things, that's what he does. He refers to Kol Ba'olam, this is for everybody. But sometimes he refers to the entire Jewish people, men, women, children. Kol Beit Yisrael, Mitzuvim al Kiddush Hashem HaGadol, the great name of God. We've discussed many times man's mission in life is to bring glory to God's name. We discussed that last week. Abram, Mike, Rabbi Shem Hashem, calling out on God's name, spreading God's name. Shame, where the sense of shame, what a ridiculous, uh, shame wasn't his name. That was his job, his job in life. Noah's son, Noah, comfortable, right? Noah, but he couldn't be Jewish. He was into comfort. That, that's, re, that's, that's really true, what, what I, I, I said before. Avram is lech lecha. Avram's on the move, anxiety, tension, difficulty. That, that's the first Jew. The Jews were, were is halacha. You've got to be moving, walking. You can't stand still. Noah, Noah was a tzaddik. But he was Noah. He rested. He couldn't be the first Jew. But no, but he started. He, he was a great guy. Halavai, we should all be like Noah. Don't let's not criticize Noah. Right? Uh, Noah. So so he had a son, Shane. That's the job of man to, to create, to give God's name glory. And Avram took it. Avram was the one who developed it the most. So now every Jew, where we that's what we have to do. Kobe Chizam Sub Makirish Hashem Hagadol, God's great name. Shinema reading Dashti with Tokyo Shell. Umuzarim Shalola Khalalo. Obviously, they go parallel. We're we're commanded not to 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 desecrate it. Okay, so now we'll get to Kate in a moment. So I said this could be chapter one. So this is the first mitzvah of the Rambam. Uh, why, why do I say that? So the Rambam, the first four chapters, so we're going to be like the rabbis in France. I, well, uh, I'm, I'm joking, but we're going to be like rabbis in France. We're going to burn the first four chapters of the Rambam. We're going to excise them. We're going to have a public burning because the first four chapters of the Rambam, whoa, that was, that's where he talks about metaphysics and all his, you know, things and uh, people didn't like it. Okay, but it's the Rambam. Okay, so people didn't like it. Great. People don't like lots of things. Um, but I'll, I'll just read to you to show you one little thing what they didn't like. Um, that this is the halacha right before. So the first four chapters, I don't understand them. Galgalim, and I, I don't know what it's talking about. Right? Yeah, but but it, um, it talks about metaphysics and God's uh, whatever, all about God. And um, and uh, but when the, this is the first time, chapter five is when he gets into the mitzvot. The, the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam is uh, is the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. That's what the Mishnah Torah is. It's a it's a guide. That's why in every chapter there are fifty one mitzvot here, ten chapter mitzvot here. Every uh, every halacha and the Rambam is introduced by how many mitzvot? Because that's what the Mishnah Torah is. It's an elaboration of the 613 mitzvot. So the Rambam, in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, lists the 613 mitzvot. The Rambam disagrees. All the whole debate, what are the 613 mitzvot? It's a whole other, uh, other subject. So the first one, the Rambam doesn't go in order, right? So the first I, I, the first five really is Anochi Hashem Alokecha, the first four chapters. But then the first mitzvah he discusses is Kiddush Hashem. But I just want to show you, and I guess we'll have to end here and pick up next week, is what the last halacha before. Inyane Arba Prakimelu. The four chapters I just explained to you. So we know how dangerous Pardes is. This is what we call Pardes. In other words, Pardes, only Rabbi Kiva survived Pardes. Kamoshamru Arba Nichnasula Pardes. So it's, that's why people were so upset. How can the Rambam write this? Even though they were great people, they, they, even the great people couldn't understand this. They went haywire. They became a Picorsim or they, they died. It couldn't be. 
you can't, pardes is the goal, Philo whatever you want to call it, philosophy, metaphysics, wh whatever you're calling it, pardes. You got to fill your stomach with bread and uh, meat. That's the Torah. To know what's permissible, what's forbidden. That's going to be now from chapter five on, the rest of the Mishnah Torah. What you are allowed to, and the Rambam wants to make it easy. Don't, I'm not going to tell you Gemaras and sources, but I don't care about any of that stuff. You just got to know bottom line what to do. Once you know the bottom line, then you can spend your life doing important things. Part days, you can spend your life in philosophy. Okay, but a Jew, have, before he can do that, he has to know some stuff. But So therefore, the Rambam cuts out all debates. All, they're not interested. Bottom line, this is what you do. So you can understand, it's a little bit, you know, uh, not everybody likes that. This is small stuff. Uh, kashrut, Shabbos, uh, Matzah, Sukkot, Tefillin. That's the, that's the small stuff. Of the big stuff. Gadol, Merkava, that's Yecheskel. I don't know. The chariots, uh, God's, God's throne. That's big stuff. The Var Katan, That's big, that's little stuff, little stuff. They're the prerequisite. You have to do that first. You have to learn a Baiva Rabba, and after you learn a Baiva Rabba, then you can do philosophy, but philosophy is much more important. This is the good that God gave us the Yeshuvah Olam. Okay, that's how we get to the world to come. We have to follow the mitzvah. This is interesting. And it's about anybody, a man or woman, Small, right? The Rambam was, by the way, even though he has some statements that we would cringe at, but his use towards women, you're really he's living in the 12th century, okay? So if you know how women lived in the 12th century, the Rambam was like eons, uh, a, a super progressive on these issues, on some of the things he does. And here you have it right here. It meant, in other words, there's no intellectual um, reason a woman can't go into pardes, right? I, I know that to us is, of course, but in the 12th century, this is not, of course, at all. And then the Rambam begins... That's the first mitzvah, really. And then the rest of the Mishnah, the, the other 995 chapters, you know, right? I've told you this before. The Rambam, the master, the, the super, 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 super genius, but the master everything, that's a codifier, the master organizer of the Rambam, he has a thousand chapters in the Mishnah Torah. That's not a coincidence. There are a thousand chapters in the Mishnah Torah. So the first four are probably, then the 996 are all this. Okay, it's getting late. So let's quickly do a review and then I'll quickly take any questions. We discuss gratitude. We have to thank God. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to be a Jew. And unfortunately, Ralph Branca's mother and so many other people hid their Judaism and who, who, who can blame them? But it, especially for, uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's not always easy. Sometimes it's really hard and terrible and they have to give up your life. Hashem. That's what this is all about occasionally. But thank God for most people today, the vast majority of Jews, it's a wonderful, uh, we have wonderful uh, uh, heritage. God gives us merit that we get reward, but more importantly, the merit, a way of life. We don't have the power necessarily to, sh to, sh to shut up our computers and to diet and all that stuff, or to have a day where we have to walk. And what are you, you can give a million examples, the Torah, or it's it's really the value system. You have to give away our money to the poor. That's where really where you see it. And the values and not to gossip and not to take revenge. So I, I would do it on my own. But because God said, I won't, I won't. Good. So that's Lizachot to Israel. And we should give thankful for our Yerusha. Torah is uh, not really an inheritance. We have to, it's a heritage that we have to... Uh, Pass it on um, to everybody in the various, um, we, we praise God in many different forms, in many different um, ways. And uh, of course, then it leads to the mitzvah of, we say Shema, but it's really the notion of, of Kiddush Hashem, which is the fundamental mitzvah of Jews, sanctifying God's name, the name of God. And of course, the opposite of Chilul Hashem, which is uh, the worst uh, we can do. So, okay, so please God, we'll, we'll continue next week with Mr. Uh, Brach, and we'll get to hopefully Korbanot, Rabbi Shmolomer, and in a couple of weeks, we'll get to Pesuket Zimra. Okay, let's see. Are there any questions? Anybody can turn off their microphone, on their microphone. I apologize for, I don't know what happened there in the That's middle. Powerful. Okay. Many, many survivors who were small children were saved by life to Christian due to abandon the Yeah, that's a different story also. If you were you were saved by um by a Christian family, yeah, that's the famous, the famous cardinal. I forget his name. He has a plot, he's not buried there in Poland. There was and we know the the from from Paris. What was that guy's name? He became uh, a cardinal. No, I I forget his name. He was a Jew, a Jewish boy. Okay. You know what? He was a man of religion. I'm sorry. 
Lustiger. Lustiger, thank you very much. That's right. Cardinal Lustiger was a Jew. Yeah, of course. He brought up in a Christian home, of course. So he was a man of religion and he went to the top of the Christian world. Brother Daniel, I've, I've, so many, so many, Brother Daniel's, I think a little bit different, but they have so, so many people like that. You know the famous stories. I think it was Rev Lau, I don't know who, or, or somebody went into monasteries, went to find like Jewish babies after the war. Sometimes the Christian families didn't want to give them up. So they'd walk in and they would say Shema Yisrael and be like a five year old kid. And the kid would answer, so they knew he he was Jewish by Shema. Shema is how you know a kid is Jewish. Yes, so uh, many, many, besides the millions who Hitler killed and the millions who were never born because Hitler killed them, um, then there are the hundreds of thousands who abandoned Judaism. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the Jews who became non-observant Jews, who became reform and conservative or as, as, as many of you know, but who maintained their Jewish identity. That's, that's already miles ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Israel. So many points about private. Yeah, Israel is in the the more acceptable form of that. It's not still. It's still Baruch Hashem. It's maybe a little bit more, but it's still not uh, acceptable to be an anti-Semite generally. Uh, thank God. Maybe not quite, but it's more and more acceptable to be anti-Israel. That's unfortunate. Okay, that's uh, not for this. Yes. Okay, thank you. Fences make good neighbors. Mitzvah are those fences. Yeah, Asus Yagdutor. That's in Perkei. We have to make even more fences. Okay, where am I? Okay, I'm back. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, time is linear, but for God, yeah, yeah. God is, uh, I, listen, I guess with Einstein, you can understand maybe these things um, a little more. It was Rav Herzog, um, Rav Herzog, who became the first chief rabbi, who did that? Okay, right. Oh, uh, oh, I didn't know that. Abraham Foxman, who was in the JDL, was, uh, was uh, saved by the Christian. I did not know that. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, um, a, a. Foxman, I think he lives in Teaneck, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, and I, I believe he's a Shomer Shabbos Jew um, who had head of the ADL for many, many years. Okay. Why does the Rambam betoch b'nei Yisrael? Ah, very good. Zev, um, please God, remind me and or send me an email and I'll discuss your question next week. Does the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem apply when you're non-Jews? It, 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 the Rambam says among Jews, but it is brothers. We'll see in um, please God next week. Okay. I uh, want to wish everybody Shabbat Shalom, everybody well. Uh, Sunday morning, uh, 1115, Rabbi Liebtag uh, continues part two of his series, How to Read a Book. Uh, Monday, uh, Dr. Guhart continues her series on Islam and, and Jews. And Monday night, we mentioned Mark Shapiro's beginning a new series on the rise of Reformed Judaism and rabbinic responses. So if you haven't registered for that, you can register. And uh, then we have all our regular classes. And um, okay, we look forward to learning with you. And please do invite a friend. And I apologize for the mic. Thank you for telling me. It was only like a one minute uh, hiatus. And I'll try to figure out what in the world went wrong. But okay. Anyways, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Be well. And we look forward to learning with you soon. Bye -bye. Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Have a great Shabbos. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Rabbi Jay? Yes. Um, I tried to write this in the in the chat, but um, I'm I'm in Detroit and there's a, a story about um, about uh, A B what's his name from the um, that you were just talking about. Right. Um, uh, what's his name? I'll tell you. What's his name? Um, Foxman. A. Foxman. Right. <clears throat> um, how he came to, to regain his Judaism. Okay. There was a rabbi here in Detroit who, um, who had escaped to Russia from Europe during the war and came back to, I don't remember if it was Warsaw or one, another big city, and he was looking for Jews, for survivors, for his family. Um, and he came, he went to the shul um, and Davin there and a few other survivors also came and, and got together. Um, A.B. Foxman's father survived and came to reclaim him from the, the nanny or the maid. Right, right. Had, who had agreed to take him and who raised him as a good Christian. Um, he, um, the, the, the little boy who was maybe five years old, he didn't want to go with his father. Um, he, this was his home. This was where he was raised. But finally the father, you know, little by little, he said, come, let's go for a walk. And it was Simcha's Torah 
So he wanted to take him to the show and they started walking. He didn't tell them that. They started walking and every time they passed a church, he, he, um, he crossed himself, the little boy. Uh, uh -huh. and they, passed, they passed a priest, he passed his hand mm. and they came to the show and, um, and the, the rabbi, um, rabbi Goldman saw this man with the little boy and he said, is he Jewish? And the father said, yes. So he lifted him up and he told the story many times and he, and there were no children in the shul. There were no Sifrei Torah. And, the, but, the, but still the, the men who were there were dancing and trying to be Misameach. Uh, he lifted him up and he said, this is our Sefer Torah. And he danced oh. with him in the center. And A.B. Foxman said that this was where he first felt the stirrings that he was a Jew. I had no idea that, uh, wow, yeah. listen, you know, you know, whoever saves one life is if they saved an entire world, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. And like, I mean, it makes the, the tragedy so much worse in a sense, you know, what we lost, but at least uh, that we, you know, did, but uh, thank you. Yeah, that was um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah. and, Years later, how they—it's a different, it's, a, it's a, another story. How they rediscovered each other, and before Rabbi Goldman died, um, there was a reunion. A.B. Faxman came to see him. All right, very nice. Okay, I do have to run and teach yes. a chat now. So, uh, okay, thank you very much, and Shabbat Shalom, and be, Shabbat shalom. be well, everybody. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. -bye.